Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think a number of you would have known me in different incarnations, uh, but I don't think you would necessarily known me in incarnation as being one of, uh, in this room, uh, Montague's oldest friends. Uh, the, uh, uh, we were, I've known him now since 1963, uh, 50, 57 years ago. And uh, I did physics, he did economics. So we weren't quite classmates, but, you know, but, uh, and please remember, he was one year my junior, which is, as you know, in the Indian system is very important. <laughs> the, uh, and, um, and because we were in different disciplines, um, I never had the benefit of seeing Montague in action. In fact, what's interesting is this, through our old friendship, I never seen him, quotes, in action in a, in a proper work environment, as distinct from one-to-ones and, uh, and informal gatherings. Um, and, um, and one of the things which came through in that period, and I, I think, um, Montague, one of your biggest claims to fame in St. Stephen's was not your getting first in economics, uh, not winning the Rector's Prize, which I won the, the year previously, but creating something called Cooler Talk. A Cooler Talk, for those of us who were at St. Stephen's, was a completely scurrilous magazine created by Mani Shankar, Montague, and another friend, Sarah Latif, back and was revolutionary because it was one of the first examples of actually students broadcasting their views in, in the public. I think, Ishad, probably you would have, by the time you, you came, you, it would have been there, well established. And uh, as I observed, and we all, Montek and I had, were neighboring rooms in, in college. And one of the things which struck me, uh, that was a particularly interesting time because you had a number of some pretty impressive heavyweight people kicking around uh, at that time, was that uh, I first came across Montek in debates, observing him. And the qualities he had then are the qualities which he's had since then, which is the lucidity, the ability to marshal arguments, being unflappable, being considered, being generous, and never point scoring. And those characteristics have actually been through over the years. And at that point in time, I went off uh, 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 a year before Montague. He went to Oxford, and I went to Cambridge. And then we really rejoined back again when he was in Delhi. And I was then uh, director of Lazard's, and Montague was then economic advisor to the prime minister. And so it happens that Rajiv and I were at Cambridge together. And so and Montague and I were St. Stephen's together. And so I went to meet Rajiv about my views about changing the financial services structure in India. And I went to meet Montague as well on that side. And out of that, uh, the, uh, the, the, the longstanding and detailed interaction started. And my perspectives on Montague are not just as a friend, but also as someone who was a civil servant in the British government with privatizations of Margaret Thatcher, someone whose father was in the ICS, and therefore I was aware of decision taking, policy making and someone who was also in financial services as well, in, including India. And uh, from that background, and we've had numerous interactions uh, over the years on every conceivable form of policy issue. And what is fascinating about the book, which I, which I have delved into, and it's a remarkable book, it's a remarkable magnum opus, because it is astonishing for its width, 30 years, depth, of knowledge, uh, information, uh, analysis, plus uh, economic in rigor of quite of a very high level. Uh, I'm not a macroeconomist. I'm, microeconomics is more my thing. However, you know uh, what is in astonishing about this book, and I think it is, it is actually it is a unparalleled chronicle of not of processes, of content, political content, of the economy and of decision taking, as well as economic analysis. It is also shows to me some of the, uh, you know, uh, it was quite interesting reading that because uh, in all our discussions uh, I had with Montague, uh, what was very interesting was the complete, with complete professionalism with which he handled what he was doing. He never let on until after he retired, how strongly he believed in market principles. 
because to have done so when he was in government would have been to actually to have been critical of what was happening in government at that time. And that factor, to me, and here is a very good friend, he never ever, I mean, it's quite interesting, when he resigned, uh, when he retired, that is when his true colors came out. And, uh, and it's very interesting reading with the M document, which some of you have read in this, in this uh, art there, where, where that is truly trailblazing. I mean, I read an account of it in the book, and I would really recommend you read that, because it was astonishing that there he was, actually, in many ways, the forerunner of things to come. Now, Montague was very fortunate that he also had Manmohan Singh at the same time, and that stellar combination is actually what propelled India on its path. The other thing which came through in that book, uh, as, as you read it through, and I'll mention, uh, you know, this is not a hagiography, but, uh, but, uh, but I will comment towards the end about things which I think could have been done differently. But what has come through about this is how is that the, the success of where India has been has been through a very careful orchestration, and you can read this in the book, of planning, not by plotting, but certainly planning, a whole series of processes to achieve an objective, often incrementally, often against great opposition, and a col collection of mindsets uh, which, have, which were deeply rooted in the Indian psyche at economic and political level. And therefore, that is one of the aspects there. The other aspects of the book, which I think, which are part of Montague's uh, character, is this, is this uh, great combination of the big picture and the detail. And, and the lucidity with which he expresses himself is pretty compelling. And, uh, and therefore, against this background, um, of the achievements. I, I think it is fascinating to, see, to say what might have been the case. Uh, having read the book, I can now more understand, because Monte was, was always very circumspect about the challenges he had in actually making progress and, uh, and in achieving where he w wanted to be. I think the, uh, uh, the areas which interested me as well, and what's interesting about what Montague's book was about is that in the areas which I was familiar with, and which I touched on, including private, private public partnerships, private power, uh, financial services, uh, what's interesting about my interaction with Montague professionally as well was his great ability to actually pick up the key essence of an issue very quickly and digest it and understand it and then work forwards. I think the... Uh, with, uh, uh, with all he's achieved, I think, you know, the, quite frankly for me, the last three, four years of the UPA government is actually irrelevant, more or less, in the big picture. I mean, there, in the big picture of achievements. And I think we can get far too obsessed by that uh, and not understand and not realize what they had achieved. Uh, when I was in the British government, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had a majority, and because of the Falklands War, she had an even bigger majority. And she could get things through, which, which the Indian government, unfortunately, did not have the ability to achieve. And part of the achievement of Montague and, uh, with, uh, and Manmohan was to achieve that. I think my only comment I'd make as you go forward, and this is part of the uh, discussion I'd like to see, is that my, if I had a criticism uh, there about what happened, was the fact that I personally felt that the institutional uh, uh, transformation in the financial services sector could have been done uh, better and more rapidly and more structurally. When I, when I met Rajiv and Montek and uh, back uh, when Rajiv Prime Minister, I, I, I gave a paper on which basically said break up UTI into four, break up GIC into four, break up LIC into four, combine all the public sector banks into four or five, and then ten years later privatize them all. Um, well, I'm still waiting for that. And, um, and uh, I think that would be my comment would be that I think the institutional side is a thing which I would wish would have gone ahead quicker and faster. But there we are. We can't have everything. So with those, with those, with those, with those uh, words, I'd like to ask Montague and Martin to come on stage.
This is India, and surprising things happen. And approximately 20 minutes ago, I was informed that I had to make a 10-minute opening address. Um, I've been spending the last five days with Isha Montek. It's not surprising to me in the least that I was told 20 minutes ago. So this is a completely extemporaneous. I hope it will be 10 minutes. I can't completely promise. And... Uh, and if it doesn't work out, it's their fault, or somebody's fault, Bonte's fault. Um, so it is an immense pleasure for me and honor to be here um, with Isha and Montek, um, who I have bo I've known both of them since, um, I think, September, or, well, I've known Montek since September, of 1971, so not quite as long as Ranjit. And I've known Isha almost at exactly the same time. Um, I arrived in the World Bank in that month, and I found myself in the development finance, I think it was called the Development Finance Division. And Montek was the Deputy Division Chief, a position he'd achieved within three years of coming to the World Bank. And therefore, he is my first boss. Um, Isha and Montek have been very dear friends, immensely dear friends, of both me and my wife, Alison, because I went, uh, I've also been married about half a century. I went with her then, and she has been here till t today. Unfortunately, I had to go back home because for many sins, she is now working for Boris Johnson. Cool. <laughs> in the number 10 on education and skills policy. It shows the immense depth of my love for her that I am, pre <laughs> that I am prepared to forgive this. Um, it was pointed out that I have been awarded some 20 years ago the, the honor of the CBE. It was carefully not noted what it stands for um, it stands, of course, for Commander of the British Empire, and you are entitled to feel suitably offended by its existence. Um, but my response when the absurdity is pointed out is that it has shown that whatever else the British have lost, and they have lost a great deal, they don't seem to have lost their sense of humor entirely. So I have known Montek for half a century. I heard him at the Oxford Union in Oxford, but I didn't know him then. I didn't attend the Oxford Union very often. I did debate a little. He was an exceptionally lucid and enjoyable debater because he was reasoned and witty and not incredibly stupid and bombastic as most of them were. But unlike him, I found the Oxford Union very difficult to take, a position I have not subsequently changed. Um, <laughs> His great qualities have never changed. He is extraordinarily intelligent. Uh, he is lucid. He is unfailingly decent. He is remarkably, and I'll come to this in a moment, detached. And of course, underneath all this, he has the great love for his family, and above all, Isha and their children and grandchildren, and one other great love, which is India. And it was the great love of India that brought him back here at the end of a very distinguished career, after about 10 years at the bank, I don't know the exact years, to work in the Indian bureaucracy, where he, th I was going to say thrived, but he did, obviously, uh, for, um, in one way or another, um, more than three decades. I'll come a bit in a minute to what I think of this. What I find truly extraordinary about this, uh, since in many other respects we agree on things, is having read the book now, this is underlined even more than I felt at the time, that I couldn't have worked in the Indian bureaucracy for a week. So working for it for 30 years is, I think, an extraordinary indication of all the qualities I've shown you, including remarkable patience, but above all, that patriotism. He believed he would make a difference. Now, I myself, um, quite surprisingly, became in 1974 the World Bank's senior divisional economist on India, 
at the age of 27. Looking back on it, it seems laughable, but there we are. And interestingly, um, my, and very importantly, my first counterpart, the person with whom I engaged in 1974, this is the end of 1974, which for those of you who are as old as I am, and I think there are quite a few in the audience, will remember, was the first oil shock. So it was a big moment. It was a big crisis. In fact, so limited were India's foreign exchange res earnings and reserves that it really wasn't at all clear how, after a quadrupling of the oil price, the Indian economy would survive. Um, but anyway, my counterpart was Manmohan Singh, who was the government of India's chief economic advisor. And he became not a close friend. I don't know whether anyone, except possibly Montek, can actually claim him to be a close friend, so disciplined is he is in, these, in his relations. But he became a very much admired friend. And it is this partnership, these two astounding Sikhs, who together have, I think, transformed India and therefore, not on their own, obviously, but in very significant measure, also the world, because this is one of the two most important development stories in the world. And they did it in a political context, and God knows that comes out of this book, along with all the other qualities, which was far more fractious, difficult, than the one that Deng Xiaoping managed to operate in from the early 1980s. So that makes the achievement uh, even more remarkable. It so happens that my very first book was on India's trade policy, which he refers to in the book. This was written in the 70s as a result of our work on India's trade policy for the obvious reasons that the foreign crisis, exchange crisis of 74 had displayed quite clearly that the country could not function with exports relative to GDP of about 4%, which basically meant as soon as the prices of imports went, everything closed down because you couldn't afford it. So I wrote on India's exports, and I came to the view that India's trade policy regime was one of the wonders of the global policy world, and not in a good way. Um, but I was quite sure that it would never change. But it did. About 10 years later, after 1991, I think the fall of the Soviet Union helped a little, but these two gentlemen helped most of all. And that began the transformation that we are celebrating, um, which still holds today, and which pulled the country out of what used to be called the Hindu rate of economic growth when I worked on it. Now, the book describes all this in full and in detail, and I wouldn't dream of going over it. We're going to have a discussion of it very soon. But it does bring out very clearly the centrality of their role, what they did, above all, that what they really did achieve, and this seems to me central, is, though they achieved many other things, but the most important thing they did is they stopped the government from stopping everything useful economically from happening. They stopped that. And of course, as I was sure would be the case, the Indian people then displayed substantial entrepreneurial and economic vigor to bring the country forward and finally to the high growth years. But this story is not over, of course. Then came the crisis. And as is perfectly clear, the country has never regained the growth rate before the crisis. And it is clear that right now it's slowing very dramatically. And that is obviously means that many challenges have returned and I think in a more difficult way than before. More difficult because a lot of the simplest things have been done. So what now has to be done is a good deal harder. And without going into it, it into great length, I'd like to note that the political context seems to me pretty obviously rather more difficult in important respects. Most obviously because one of the things and I think as an outsider, but a very friendly one, I can say this, that one of the things that I most admired 
and survive almost intact throughout all those troubled years, except for the emergency, which I remember extremely well, I was working on India at the time, was the fundamental stability of India's democracy. And for the first time in my life, I've begun to wonder whether that will survive. In any case, I would like to say this is a wonderful book by a very important man who in conjunction with a man who he himself would agree was even more important, at crucial moments, transformed this country. It's a tremendous achievement, and we'll discuss it, but the story is not over. It is very definitely not over, and interesting, and I'll come to this when we talk, he knows that. The last chapter makes it clear that he knows that, and that's the challenge for you all from now on. Thank you very much. So let's start talking about the book. Um, you don't want to make any introductory remarks? We'll go no, I think you've, you've said wonderful things, so I, yes. let's get on it with It only the, gets worse after discussion. that, doesn't it? Okay. Um, I think one of the important things about uh, your life, I think this comes out pretty clearly, was that you were at the World Bank. And that allowed you, to, I think, and I'm going to ask you whether that's the case, and if so, how, to think that the way things would, had been done in India and were being done in India in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were not the only way to do things. So what did you learn from those years in the World Bank before you came back? Well, I think uh, probably for everybody of my generation at that time, uh, the big thing in the global development lessons was that East Asia had done so well, uh, and we had not. And the, the contrast in performance during the 70s was actually very stark. In the World Bank, I used to work on income distribution related issues. And you know, the line that we were plugging then was that if you really want to improve the conditions of living or the poor or the lower 50, 40%, uh, it has to be done through more rapid growth but the growth has to be of a kind that actually trickles down. I mean, trickle, flood, whatever, but the idea that you can tackle the problems of the lower 40%, 50% without growth was simply wrong. And you know, in the bank, that, that line was picked up, uh, several other people were saying the same thing. You know, the interesting thing is that in India, in the early 60s, uh, the planning commission at the time, I mean, Pandit Nehru had asked the planning commission, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that we take everybody above the minimum level of living, as it was then called? And the planning commission had done his calculations and said that, look, we need to grow at about 7%. I mean, those were days when targets were 5% and we weren't achieving the targets. We need to grow at about 7%. If you grow at 7%, not everybody will benefit equally. And maybe the bottom 20% need some extra support. So it was going to be growth plus distribution. Now, in fact, what happened, and you know, in this book that I wrote with Hollis Jennery and three or four other colleagues, we actually acknowledged uh, the Planning Commission's work in terms of perspective planning as emphasizing the importance of growth, uh, but at the same time making sure that you know, nobody gets left out. Uh, but I think in India that message got lost. Uh, growth was nowhere near 7%, it was about half of that. Uh, and the focus was all therefore on how to bring about distribution. And nobody sat back and said, why is growth so low? And to my mind, that was the central question. Of course, you know, since East Asia had done so well, uh, the lessons of why it had done so well, open economies, promoting labor intensive exports, et cetera, et cetera, was all well known. And I felt that we were going completely down the wrong path. And when I came back in 79, it was with the hope that I'd have some role in trying to shift policy in that direction. So then you, we enter the, your period in here, um, uh, the first period in government, and you describe your relations with a, and quite a number of people, including particularly, I think, stands out with Rajiv Gandhi. But nonetheless, really and truly, nothing happened, or nothing much happened for more than a decade. Were there moments when you said to yourself, this is completely crazy, I am <laughs> wasting, you don't say this in the book, uh, I'm wasting my time, it's far too frustrating, I should go and do something else. No, I didn't actually, because uh, in the 1980s, it was the first signal of the beginnings of change, but very, very incremental. 
Uh, the first half of that, Mrs. Gandhi was a prime minister. But you know, since people associated her very much with the old left-oriented policies, the very fact that she spoke a different language sort of uh, raised hope. Rajiv Gandhi, of course, was much clearer. I mean, he talked about the 21st century. That may just look like an aspirational hope. But in Parliament, and I mentioned this in the book, he actually said, we cannot expect to compete with other countries if we work with systems that are 20 years out of date. Now, that gave me the hope that we need to change the system. I mean, after all, no Indian prime minister in Parliament had ever said that we need to change the system. But of course, change was very slow in the Rajiv Gandhi government. Within two years, the Beaufort scandal sort of completely disrupted everything. But you felt that, you know, somehow we will manage, we'll get another, another opportunity. Remember, in the 1980s, the actual economic performance in response to this slight change, slightly more pro private sector attitude, uh, economic performance had improved. So, I mean, if you come into the government at the end of the 70s with a background of 3.5% growth, and at the end of the 80s, if the growth is about 5.5%, you don't get frustrated. Although we knew that we needed to do much more and that we could do much better. So let's come to the, 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 the great moment of 1991, the 1991 balance of payments crisis, which you discuss, of course, at some length. To the outsider, it's pretty obvious that you used a perfectly manageable balance of payments crisis as an opportunity, it might not have seemed so at the time, as an opportunity to conduct a whole range of reforms that you've been thinking about for years. How quickly did you realize this was the moment, this was the opportunity, and how easy was it then, because of the preparation you'd done, your understanding with Dr. Mamo and Singh, um, to get it done? I mean, how did that unfold from your perspective? Well, I was very clear that it was an opportunity, and my feeling is that Dr. Manmohan Singh also. You know, I had just done the M document, where, yes. which I tried to draw attention to the fact that the reason things were not happening as much as they should is that we were picking up odd initiatives here and there and implementing them and calling them reforms. Whereas what we needed to do was to diagnose what is the holistic change that we need. I mean, let me just give a very simple example. Everybody in the private sector wanted to get rid of government controls on their own investment, which is understandable. They probably in this very room would be discussing all the reasons why it should be done. But very few of them were interested in liberalizing imports. And it was quite clear that it would be meaningless to liberalize investment licensing if licenses for co uh, capital goods were still going to be given by the Commerce Ministry. I mean, the people who used to line up before the Industry Ministry for licenses would have to line up before the Commerce Ministry. So this notion that if you want to liberalize industrial licensing, you must also liberalize imports, this was never put together. Because in our system, each ministry would do its own thing. And the liberalization of imports was a Commerce Ministry matter, not an Industry Ministry matter. A related issue is that if you're going to liberalize imports, how are you going to manage the balance of payments? Clearly, you're going to have to keep the fiscal deficit under some kind of control, kind of aggregate demand management, and you need a better exchange rate policy. So if everybody wants imports, let the exchange rate depreciate. This could never have been done either by the industry ministry or the commerce ministry, because the relevant institutions for putting those uh, pieces of the puzzled together are the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank. So in the M document, what I try to put forward is that, look, let's agree on a interrelated set of measures, which are a core set of measures. And I think that uh, it was discussed, it was very controversial. Many people you know, objected strongly, but I was very encouraged that many people actually supported it. Uh, and in, in, in my way, uh, in my view, the outcome of that discussion was that there are people who understand the whole thing. We need a much better discussion of these things so that you can evolve a consensus. So in that sense, this had been discussed. Then you had the crisis. You know, governments are in a very good position if, they, if they've just come in after a crisis. I mean, it's very difficult to manage a crisis if you've caused it. 
But you know, if somebody else has caused the crisis and you come in, that's an ideal position to say, these guys have mucked it up. We're going to do something radically different. And you know, Manmohan Singh actually, he himself made a speech in April of 1991, before he even became finance minister in the uh, Indian Institute of Management, where many of the ideas he pushed were exactly the ideas that I had in the M document. I mean, he had a similar view. So we were in an ideal position. In fact, I remember, I don't mention this in the book, that on one discussion where, for example, the IMF, quite rightly, was very concerned about uh, bringing the fiscal deficit down, which I thought was correct. But I also felt there was a trade-off. And I suggested that, look, if it's difficult to bring the fiscal deficit down, do more reforms and offer the IMF a trade-off that we'll do more reforms than you think. And that is, by the way, exactly what we did. Because the IMF did not have in mind import liberalization of the kind we did. And the IMF did not have in mind changing the exchange rate system. So it was a great opportunity. Uh, I mean, I think the Chinese say that, you know, the word uh, crisis in Chinese is the same as opportunity, and I think we kind of lived up to that. So one of the things that comes out of your book, but it's particularly important at this point, but it's, it's subsequently too, you had, I don't know whether the, the, what word you'd use, the blessing of and the important support of the Prime Minister at the time, Narasimha Rao, but the truth is, you didn't then, nor have reformers really ever since, had the, had the full-throated, vocal, committed, and politically clarifying support of the leading politicians of India. And so you describe your reforms then, and I think subsequently, as having been done, quote-unquote, by stealth. How big... And this comes out more and more, it seems to me, just reading the whole book. How big a problem is it that, as it were, the most fundamental policy changes that have occurred in India have occurred, as it were, almost behind the back of the entire democratic political <laughs> establishment? Uh, I mean, the disjunction between policy and politics is just staggering. Well, I mean, uh, as the leading economic journalists in the world, you're right to put that as sharply as you do. Uh, you're probably slightly exaggerating, but I think it's true that um, in the first two years after the crisis, the political establishment fully owned the reforms because the reforms were seen as managing a crisis. I mean, it's to the credit of the system, and I give this credit largely to Dr. Manmohan Singh, that even after the crisis was over, because it was over by 1993, the reforms continued in a slow kind of way. And you know, I, I make a distinction between three kinds of reforms. I mean, one is of course what you just call Big Bang reform. You go there and say, enough of this, we're moving into a brave new world and all these things are going to change. That's not practical. Not practical, certainly, in a, in a highly diverse uh, democracy with many different interests. So the second approach is a gradualist approach. And you say, look, we're going to make big changes. Uh, but in introducing these changes in a very short time uh, can be very disruptive. So in order to minimize the disruption, we're going to phase these changes in. That reduces a little bit the opposition. Uh, uh, but you lay out quite clearly uh, what you're going to do. I mean, for example, the import duties are 150%, but in five years we want to bring it down to 30%. So that's a phase transition. Uh, the, another view, another approach is that you indicate the broad directions of reform, but you don't actually indicate what the phasing of reform is. You just wait until the political circumstances enable you to take a step, and you take a step. Now, I call that opportunistic reform. And the final one is reform by stealth, where you sort of really don't, really don't build a consensus that we want to make this change. But when you can, you make it. And you don't even claim that this is part of a logical move. Uh, I think Mr. Narasimha Rao's famous uh, comment to a journalist who asked him, uh, how come, Prime Minister, you have changed 180 degrees? To which he said, I haven't changed 100, I haven't turned 180 degrees. The world has turned under me. 
Now, that's very clever, but in effect, is not taking leadership. He's not saying, look, we need it to change. So I think that's where there is, there is a lack of leadership problem in the political class. And a lot of the reform directions uh, have, in subsequent years have just kind of happened, uh, but with not as much clarity in explaining to people that we need to change. I mean, I think, for example, the, uh, uh, the big change of the 1991 period was uh, giving up the idea that the public sector must play a dominant role. I think that successfully was done, uh, but we were never able to do any privatization. I mean, sectors got privatized because the public sector units just didn't expand, didn't do well, and the private sector guys crowded them out. I mean, airlines is a good example. Um, but you know, for example, on the, in other areas, uh, we talked about reform like labor market reform, but just didn't happen. So I think, these are issues that somehow were not joined, and they are controversial. And they must be picked up in the political process. And when there's a, a, a pushback, then you have to address that issue. And I, I personally hope we need to do more of that. And we haven't done enough. So let's follow up on that. I was being a little bit facetious, but not entirely, when I said that you, know, you had this array of control systems, multiple overlapping controls. You've discussed uh, industrializing licensing, import licensing, the most extraordinary monopolies control regime, foreign exchange licensing or controls over and above, import controls. Um, and in some sense, although this is being very, very simplistic, it's sort of simple, quote unquote, for a few officials to, to say, well, we're going to just stop doing this mm. and then see what happens. Now, there's been since then um, a lot of literature among economists working on India, overwhelmingly, of course, Indians, like Vijay Joshi, lots of others, who talk about second generation reforms, by which they mean reforms of factor markets and factor supply, so education the quality of the labor force, land markets, capital markets, and particularly banking and finance, institutional reform and institutional development across a whole wide range of institutions um, uh, um, and so forth, public sector reform being central in that, you've talked about it, reform of the public sector, administration, the legal system, a whole slew of things. And the sense is, really and truly, you haven't done most of these mm -hmm. as a country very much. And it's now 30 years since your reforms. And I'll come to with the significance of that. Would you first of all agree that the progress in these various areas has truly been disappointing? Um, and if you do, what, to what do you largely attribute it? The lack of real political belief in doing these things, the power of interest groups in a, in a highly diverse and pluralistic society, the, uh, the fact you're a democracy. Um, the Chinese would say that, after all, it's the fact you're a democracy. Um, <laughs> terrible mistake. Uh, the, the complexity of your federation, I mean, that comes out beautifully. The, the number of things you have to discuss with the states and the crucial things the states have to do, the power sector, for example, or just the lack of qu high quality politicians. So what is it, to what do you attribute this if you agree this is a feature of what's happened in the, in the last 20, 30 years? Well, first, let me, let me agree that um, it is disappointing because perhaps not all of these things could have been done but I think we could have made much more progress on some of these things. In the book, for example, I mentioned that uh, the, change the need to change the attitude towards the public sector. I mean, I discussed this with Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Mind you, at that time, I thought that, you know, I, I was making a very limited point, that even if you want the public sector in the dominant sectors of the economy, what on earth is the justification of having the public sector in hotels? And it was pretty clear that the public sector hotels were not the best use of all the prime property on which they were sitting. Uh, 
I think he realized that. But, you know, partly within the Congress party, this had been a long-standing commitment to the public sector. But, you know, we, we've had changes in government that slowly the attitude did change, that we can get rid of uh, government majority ownership. Uh, the Vajpayee government took the first steps towards what I would call genuine privatization, handing over companies. I mean, Arun Shuri deserves the credit for actually doing that. But, you know, even in that party, he ran into pro uh, problems after one or two successful privatizations. So it's not just somehow it cannot be just done as an administrative measure. You have to come up front and say we need to do it. And perhaps even in the Vajpayee government, uh, Arun didn't get the backing from the very top. So there's a, there's a kind of a substratum of opposition in this area, which, uh, I mean, present government is talking about privatization. Let's see how much it succeeds. But certainly this should have been done much earlier. It's a no-brainer. Some of the other things like the, uh, take, take banking reform. I mean, this has also been on the agenda. Now, originally, uh, the perception, and I kind of shared this perception, actually, that if, you, if it's politically very difficult to uh, lower the government holding in public sector banks, maybe we can find some other way of achieving the sort of freedom from uh, interference by the bureaucracy, which usually means interference without taking responsibility. Now, you know, the PJ Nayak committee has made a very sensible suggestion. Uh, I don't need to repeat it, but uh, essentially that you, you retain your majority holding in the public sector banks, but you dump it all into a, uh, a holding company. The, you let that holding company be run by a distinguished finance professional, and let the holding company appoint all the chairman and the executive positions in the public sector banks. So take the finance ministry out of that completely. Uh, and I think also you, you, you create a level playing field for the public, uh, for the Reserve Bank in the extent of control it has over private banks versus public banks. I mean, at the moment, the Reserve Bank of India can remove a chief executive of a private sector bank if he feels that it isn't doing, he isn't the right man for the job or the right woman for the job. They can't do that for the public sector. And there is no justification, in my view, for an asymmetric control by the Reserve Bank over the entities that it regulates. Now, you know, this has been around for the past several years and nothing has happened. In the book, I mean, I suggest uh, taking a leaf out of Abhijit Banerjee's book that maybe we should take half the public sector banks and send them down the PJ Nayak route and let the other half be governed the way they are at present. And 10 years later, see whether, which group of banks does better. I mean, I'm firmly of the view that the finance ministry adds no value at all to the commercial quality of a public sector bank. But the only way of testing this out, I mean, if you simply say, no, no, get it out completely, there will be innumerable uh, uh, objections, but what I'm suggesting becomes an experiment. Half the banks go down one route, half the banks go down another. It'll take 10 years to work out uh, whether, whether it will make a difference. But as you say, otherwise it's taken 30 years and nothing much has happened. So we need, we need to do something innovative along those lines. Are you not, just to follow up there, is, I could follow up in all these segments, but just to focus on the banks. Are you not being a sort of faux naive, um, because really and truly, as a number of people have suggested, um, public sector banks aren't there to be good banks. <laughs> That's not their purpose. They're, they're there to be slush funds for central government, powerful central government politicians and possibly policymakers to allow them to spread money around in states where they want to spread money around. And if they lose money in the process, it's a complete matter of indifference. <laughs> in exactly the same way that the purpose of the power sector for many state politicians is to provide free power to farmers. It doesn't have any other purpose. That's what it's there for. <laughs> um, so the political obstacles, when you look at these very many segments, are absolutely overwhelming. And that's why, mm -hmm. in fact, it hasn't happened. No, uh, there's no doubt that uh Competitive democratic politics will push politicians uh, 
to adopt policies that will seem to be, as it were, giving short-term benefits to voters and not push policies that will yield long-term benefits because they want to get a quick return before the next election. That's true. I mean, how do you stop that? I think the only way you stop that is to have a tight budget constraint. I mean, if, if, a, cent, if a government, if a, if a state Which government... Which would include, in this case, a very tight control of over what these banks do. Well, I mean, a, a budget constraint on the central... I mean, at the moment, the state governments are not supposed to be borrowing beyond the limits specified by the central government. But happily, I mean, they borrow indirectly through the banks in various ways. So if the Reserve Bank were to introduce uh, regulatory restrictions on that kind of borrowing, slowly you would find a bit of a squeeze. I mean, the key thing, the key thing is that between a state government that is simply chasing populist uh, solutions and a state government that is being more responsible, uh, I mean, may have some wealth, I'm not against welfare schemes, but you know, not just rank pop, uh, populist measures. If, if there are state governments that behave better and perform better, then over time, uh, perhaps the electorate will begin to see that this is actually a better government than the other one. But there's no, in a democratic process, there is no substitute for having electorates that are actually aware of what is good policy. And we know around the world that there's no guarantee that the electorates behave sensibly. And they're quite often uh, pulled in directions in which you and I may not agree. Well, this is not a question I intended to ask, but as I understand it in India, there have been very large divergences over very long periods in the performance, among the performances of different states. And it hasn't had the impact that you seem to hope for and that, I must say, I had expected on the performance of some of the more poorly performing states. It's rather disappointing. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm not so, I mean, I haven't seen a proper analysis of whether, uh, basically the issue is, does a good performing state vote back a well-performing government? My guess is that uh, it's the, the record on that is a little bit better than we think. But I would like a political scientist to analyze that much more closely. I mean, the other point is that, you know, we have lots of small states so I think we ought to take the major states and see uh, what difference it makes. I'd love to go on with that, but there are some other big questions. So growth peaked in India in the uh, first seven years, I think you say, of the UPA government, certainly um, in the period leading up to the financial crisis. And under both your government and the current government, it has never returned to those pre-crisis levels, mm -hmm. and at the moment it seems to be slowing rather sharply. So we need to understand this as economists. It's very important, this fact, that we've, people thought we might be getting, lots of people thought India might be getting to 8% growth on a s sustainable basis, and that's clearly gone, and people are now talking about three percentage points below that. So what has gone wrong? Let me just uh, suggest there are three possible explanations, it seems to me, and I'd, I'd like to see how you analyze it. Sort of forget that you're in the government, as it were, as an analyst, what do you think? One is actually the pre-crisis growth was a completely unsustainable boom brought about by exceptional circumstances worldwide in terms of credit availability and a one-off massive credit boom here. Two, this is not mutually exclusive. After the crisis, you did a fiscal and monetary stimulus, um, and together they exacerbated debt problems, adding government debt problems, and of course, by definition, allowing the debt overhang to continue, not be resolved, accumulate up in the private sector in subsequent uh, in subsequent years. And the third possibility is all that was needed, that actually you had had the benefit of your reforms of the 90s and early 2000s, that had been done, and what you desperately needed were those follow-up reforms. They never happened. And so the growth is slowing because those follow-up reforms never happened, and now it's beginning to become very visible. 
these are not mutually exclusive, but they're very important to solve because they, they give you different views of what <clears throat> the lessons are and above all how temporary this is. Is it a cyclical problem, big long cyclical problem, a structural problem which is relatively quickly handled, lots of debt, lousy banks, all that, or is it something much bigger? Um, fundamental diminution of investment opportunities because important reforms have never happened. How do you assess it? Well, I think there's an element of all those things. Let me say that, you know, um, the growth rate in the pre-crisis, the pre-2008 period, was actually higher than 8.4. 8.4 is the average growth rate of the first seven years. And I'm now using the GDP at factor cost measure, okay? So it includes a couple of years which are post-crisis where the fiscal stimulus jacked up the growth. Um, so if you take that 8.4, uh, the fact that the global economy has slowed down, I would certainly agree that it's going to be very difficult to get back to 8.4, but you know the norm could be something a little below 8, uh, maybe 7.6. We're nowhere near there. So while there is a cyclical element to the slowdown, what you're seeing right now, where the most recent quarterly GDP number has a growth rate of 4.5%, is not just cyclical. Uh, yes, there's a cyclical element, but a lot of it is structural. Now, what is that structure? You know, one view is that uh, some of the, if you think of the demand-related engines, I mean, private investment is poor. I don't think that over a medium term, this should be replaced by public investment. I mean, we've seen that movie before. So we really need to get the private investment back up. Obviously, private investment of a competitive kind, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to ask yourself the question, why is private investment uh, so poor? But another element of demand which is performing very poorly is exports. I mean, export performance in the last five or six years in dollar terms is virtually flat. And while it is easy to say, oh, the world economy has slowed down, I mean, Bangladesh faces the same world economy, Vietnam faces the same world economy, and they're booming. So it's clearly the case that our export performance has slipped. So we need to analyze that and work out what is causing the problem. Uh, there may be some institutional, I mean, there are obviously longer term reforms, logistics improvement, infrastructure, this, that, and the other. But there are also problems with the way the GST is functioning. I mean, lots of people tell me that the way it operates, that, you know, exporters are not getting the tax refunds that are due under the system. One reason they're not getting it is because the fiscal situation is strained, so the government doesn't want to give refunds. I personally think that... Uh, Holding back expenditure that is due in order to hide the fiscal deficit is a huge mistake. It would be much better if the government would just come clean and say, look, this controller and auditor general has told us that practice A, B, and C uh, is wrong. They could even say that these are not just practices we've introduced. Maybe they ha some of them happened before, although they have become much stronger in the last few years. And we're coming clean and saying, look, the fiscal deficit is over 5%, and we're going to bring it down over time. If you do that, then the current uh, demand constraint that pe which people face because the government isn't paying bills due to contractors and tax refunds, etc., this problem would be taken care of. I think there's also uh, uh, you know, this argument that uh, private investment uh, seems a little overwhelmed uh, by the possibility that tax authorities can act arbitrarily and take a lot of action against them. I mean, that is what uh, Rahul Bajaj had in mind uh, in this city when he said, and you know, Rahul, I mean, for the last 30 years has been speaking his mind, which is to, hugely to his credit. And he told uh, an audience which included the Home Minister, uh, roof, sort of ruefully saying, in the UPA days, we could abuse anyone we like. But now we don't dare say anything, you know, because there is an element of fear. I think you have to ask him what exactly he meant by the element of fear. He didn't elaborate. But I think most people feel that, you know, if a government is not, doesn't want to tolerate dissent, then it's quite possible that businesses will feel harassed by tax authorities. 
And the tax authorities are also in a very peculiar position because, you know, we have set unrealistic targets for revenue in order to control the fiscal deficit. And come the end of the year, they're under pressure. What are you doing about achieving this target? So the easiest thing to do is raise a large number of tax demands. It's a vicious circle that needs to be broken somehow. And I think on exports, quite frankly, uh, what worries me is that one of the big successes of the 91 reforms was the acceptance of the proposition that if you open up the economy and reduce import duties, you make the Indian production structure much more cost effective. And this actually helps exporters. We seem to be reversing that. And you know, this is a recent reversal, because even during the current government's regime, uh, in the first two years or so, uh, the, the Niti Aayog, which is the successor institution to the Planning Commission, was chaired by Arvind Panagriya. And Panagriya on duties has said, we must bring duties down, reduce the variation, move towards a near uniform rate of 7%. I thought that was quite sensible, and that continued what has been a 30-year trend. I mean, the Narsim Rao, Manmohan Singh, United Front, Vajpayee government, the UPA continuing it. And in the first two years, the signal given by Panagriya was, I thought, very sensible. But that's been clearly reversed. That, I mean, if you're going to raise duties, don't be surprised that exports do badly. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, if you feel that Indian industry is under competitive pressure, uh, one option is that you raise duties, the other is that you depreciate the exchange rate. If you do the latter, the import substitution is just as much help, but the exporters have a ball. This way, you're helping those who are competing against imports and hurting exporters. So to my mind, those are clear policy mistakes that need to be corrected. I think there's also, this is all demand side stuff. I think there's also on the supply side, this, the straight total factor productivity growth type approach, which over a medium term is very important. And all these missing reforms that you mentioned are very critical. Look, the most important of those is getting back to a functioning banking system, which, I mean, we cannot expect the economy to grow at 8% or so with inflation at 4%. The nominal growth would be 13%. You know, credit has to grow at about 15% or something of that order. I mean, the credit to GDP ratio in India is much lower than in all these other countries. So the credit should grow faster than the nominal growth of GDP. With the present situation in the public sector banks, there's no chance of that happening. Because bankers, many people will tell you, are just afraid to lend. We've created an atmosphere in which uh, it's, if you are a public sector banker, the best thing is not to lend just buy some government bonds and help the government run a huge fiscal deficit uh, with a relatively lower interest burden. That's what's happening. Um, this actually leads me, I hadn't intended to at this point, but then I'll come back to the very last question because I know we don't have much time. But is relevant to your assessment of the current political and economic situation in India and I just want to know with how strongly you really believe in what I, I'm, the quote I'm just going to give you, which you will recognize. Good economics, you write, may not seem to be good politics in the short run, but wise political leaders will realize that it is almost always the best politics in the long run. How to marry the two is in some sense the real test of political leadership. I remain an unrelenting optimist <laughs> that our political system can resolve this conflict, that the India story of high growth and development will therefore continue. India can and must retain return to its high growth years. Our younger generation deserves nothing less. Really and truly, when you look around now, are you that optimistic? I think that's the last sentence yes. of the epilogue. Right? Yes. We must end on a positive note. No, but let me say... Um, you can I, now retract I am, it. I am optimistic. I'll tell you why. I mean, look, we've been through really bad crises before. I mean, when I came back in 1979, things were a complete mess. The ideological hold uh, over the system, pushing all kinds of old policies, was enormous. And I didn't think that would change very much, and it did. 
We've had other crises. 91 was another crisis where we managed to get something done. I'm not saying we should have a crisis, though frankly, uh, a growth rate of 4.5% is a crisis. I mean, there's a mistaken notion in India that a crisis is only a crisis if it's a balance of payments crisis. You could have a crisis which is a growth stagnation crisis, where basically the balance of payments remains sort of what it is, but you don't have growth, you don't have employment. To my mind, the political pressure to do something in that context should be just as strong. So I would hope that somehow in the system, uh, pressure would build up that, look, this is the sort of strategy that we need, but it's very important not to do the wrong thing. And I think this is, you know, uh, my old uh, senior colleague, Gopi Arora, and I think I mentioned this somewhere in the book. And he used to have a plaque on his desk which said, this is a crisis. We must do something. This is something. Therefore, let's do it. <laughs> now, you know, uh, if somebody says that uh, uh, there's too much happening on imports, we must raise exports, uh, this is a crisis, let's raise import duties. That is exactly that kind of thinking. So the danger of getting the wrong things done is very high. But you know, if somebody thinks about it, uh, hopefully they'll work out. Uh, how do you take care of this problem? What do you do? Uh, and, uh, you know, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that uh, the system will continue to tolerate non-performance. Now, of course, you know, if it turns out that the economy suddenly rebounds and everybody says the $5 trillion economy is now within, within, uh, within sight, then there won't be a change. But that's not happening right now. I mean, my own prediction, prediction but my own assessment is that we're going to end the current year well below 5% below five GDP growth. And next year, you're not going to be much better than maybe five and a half or something of that order. You know, on the other hand, you've got a target that you want to reach a $5 trillion economy. It's a good aspirational target, but what that target means is that from 1999, uh, sorry, from 2019-20, up to 2024, 25, the average growth rate must be 9%. So if in the first two years, the average growth rate is only five, in the remaining four years, the growth rate will have to be, you know, 10% or so. Well, I mean, if it happens next year or year after, people might feel something's happening. But if it doesn't, there must be some signal that we're off track. And the moment that signal is there, somebody must look at what, what they need to do. This, fi this $5 trillion economy reminds me of one of the first things I was told when I joined the Financial Times, or maybe it was even earlier. Anyway, the first rule of forecasting is either give a date or a number, but never both. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of brave. Uh, um, but but uh, five years is a long time in politics. Um, I'm supposed to stop now, and I'm going to give you the, the floor some opportunity to ask your question, but I have one last question. Um, looking back at the whole career that you have had, which you describe in full in this fascinating book, what is the achievement you're most proud of? I can sort of think that uh, that's probably obvious. You can answer fairly easily. And what do you most regret? Well, I think what we, are, we should be most proud of, uh, and there were many people who participated in that, is the dismantling of one of the most ridiculous systems of industrial control over the private sector, combined with the liberalization of import. I mean, as I pointed out earlier, to be proud of one and renege on the other will be a humongous mistake. But frankly, we did manage to get rid of both, and we also managed to move to a flexible exchange rate. I think I'm quite proud of that. You know, on the capital account, free flow of capital, I think actually we did quite well. We didn't liberalize it instantly as many people wanted, even including within the government. We adopted a much more cautious approach. And I think the IMF, which in those days was a great advocate of don't worry about it, liberalize like mad, uh, recognized today that for a country, a developing country, 
a gradual move towards capital account convertibility is the way to do it. And we managed to do that with quite a bit of capital flowing in. And I think the capital market reforms in the, in, 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 in the Indian capital markets sort of facilitated that. It took a longer time than it should have, but I would say that was a major achievement. Biggest regrets, no, well, failure to do anything on privatization of the public sector. I mean, I've been an advocate, a silent advocate of this for quite a long time. And frankly, I, I think we should have been able to do much more. It's a real pity that Arun Shuri's initiative, uh, which was a bold one, sort of simply fizzled out, even in that government. Let's see what happens now. I think that, you know, um, one of the second generation reforms that uh, we did think about, which is uh, not just think about, but we articulated, to create uh, an institutional framework, institutional come regulatory framework, in which public-private partnership and in infrastructure would actually work. I mean, I'm quite clear in my mind that the investment that we need in infrastructure, if we are even remotely serious of getting back to 8% growth, is much larger than anything the public sector can do. Therefore, public-private partnership has to be part of the system. But you know, the, while there are some outstanding success stories in public-private partnership, I mean, nobody thought that we would have private airports like in Delhi and Mumbai uh, 15 years ago. Uh, so it's not as if it didn't have success. Many of the roads that got built are also pretty good roads and they're functioning and functioning well. But there were problems and dispute resolution in public-private partnership is a mess. And the private sector typically believes that there is no partnership. The moment you sign a contract, the guy on the other side does not view you as a partner. He views you as someone who should be tied to perform uh, the last sort of whatever mile or step specified in the contract. And they say that, look, uh, a contract that's going to be valid over 30 years, I mean, so many things are going to change that if you don't have the ability to be flexible, uh, you're creating trouble. Now, we did think of suggesting various things. I mean, one of the things we suggested was we should have a law on public-private partnership to sanctify that this is important. That would set up, enable you to set up institutions under the law which would enable government officials uh, to actually take an appropriately flexible approach. Uh, we did discuss this in the last year or so of the UPA, but you know, ideas that are put forward uh, towards the end of a government have to be picked up by the successor government. And actually, the NDA government had appointed Vijay Kelka uh, as, as a committee, and they more or less picked up the same ideas, saying we must do something of this kind, but it hasn't happened. So that is a, is a really big regret, because without that, that framework, uh, it is not going to be possible to build the sort of regulatory, build the kind of uh, uh, aggressive, imaginative, a public-private partnership effort which you need. So I'm going to, the organizer will stop me. We're only slightly late, not that insanely, I think. So about 15 minutes of Q&A. Ah, somebody wants to ask a question, um, please perhaps say who you are and make it a question. Yes. I'm Mudit Jain, a businessman. So in the first few years of liberalization in the 90s, it was good for industry, sir. But say seven, eight years later, Indian industry got outsourced overseas or start closing down. We are in manufacturing, so what would you like to say? Because uh, much of Indian, the manufacturing sector is very uh, un, uh, unhealthy and uh, not expanding. Since when? Uh, sorry. From 1999 or so, I see many industries closed down in India and many got outsourced overseas. Can I, I'm gonna take yeah, two or three and ration them. So yes, okay. Uh, thank very, you, Martin. It's a delight to be here who, today. Who, who? Ajit Ranade. My name okay. is Ajit Ranade. Uh, Vontek, thanks very much for writing the book, and thanks to Isher to make sure you, you wrote it. I'm going to ask you a very personal and somewhat, uh, you know, I'm taking the liberty of our friendship. The question is, there's a, there's a, there's a quote of yours which, is, which came to haunt you, if that's my interpretation. At some point in the late 90s, you said that the Planning Commission should be shut down. And it's a quirk and irony of uh, your career that you spend the maximum time uh, 
as uh, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. So I just want to know what you think about that. And of course, you did many things, including the PPP story in the Planning Commission. Okay, one more question. Is anybody towards the back? Uh, is there a lady, perhaps? Yes. Over there, the lady there, please. Say who you are. Uh, my name is Navika Harshe. Um, my question was on politics and economics, and you said that good economics eventually makes good politics. But isn't there a time element? How do you decide how long you have to wait? So a politician deciding today is not looking at 30 years. So for him, good politics makes more sense than good economics? <laughs> OK. Um, so basically, after a few nice years at the beginning, you've just allowed the Chinese to destroy Indian industry. That's what I think I read, <laughs> as we say there. And it's all your fault. How do you respond? Yeah. Well, uh, look, first, um, you know, the proposition that certain kinds of industries shut down and got relocated is not the same thing as industry shut down. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, if we are running a system in which every industry, no matter how inefficient, was being protected, and you move to a system where protection is A, moderated, and B, made more uni uh, uniform, some industries will, as you put it, get outsourced. So that, for an individual industry, is not the problem. It's not my impression, by the way, that in the post-liberalization period, Indian industry from 1999 onwards did that badly. Uh, in fact, if you look at the entire period from 2002 right up to 2011, Indian industry was having a ball. And it's just not true. So just check, check up the statistics. I can well believe that some industries did get outsourced, but then, you know, you expect that. Um, second, on the Planning Commission. You know, I, uh, there is, I think that was your, uh, Ajit Ranade's question. You know, there's a, very, uh, there's a very gut feeling on the part of many people in Mumbai that uh, to say that the Planning Commission should be shut down is actually a way of saying let's have sensible economic policy. You know, this is based on a this is based on a complete misreading of what the planning commission did. We were not Soviet planners laying down targets. And I think therefore you have to judge the planning commission by the results. And the results are very clear. During the 10 years that you had a planning commission, you had an average growth rate of 7.6%. You then shut it down. The last growth rate is 4.5. So on that basis, I'm not all that convinced that your argument is very sound. I agree, if you cause the economy to boom, we should certainly take a second look. This but is cherry-picking cherry statistics, <laughs> to cherry put picking. it mild. No, 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 even if you look at the average, by the way. I mean, if you look at the average of the last six years, it'll be about 6.5. Whereas if you look at the previous 10, it would be something like 7.6. Anyway, that's not the point I'm making. The real point I'm making is uh, the notion that somehow planning commission equals Soviet style planning is false. Uh, the notion that governments shouldn't plan is false. Uh, the notion that governments should just get out of the way and let the private sector do everything is also misleading. And I think based on that, something has to do it. Now, whether you call it Niti Aayog or something else, that I have, I'm very open about. The question is, what are the planning functions that uh, an economy, that a government needs to perform, and where does it perform them? So that's the way to look at it, in my view. Now, the last question, the really good one, I mean, you know, this business of the time frame, and, you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh is very fond of one phrase, and I'm not sure that I've used it uh, in the book. And that phrase is that, you know, to become statesmen, uh, politicians have to be in power long enough. And that's the crux of it. If democratic politics means competing every five years, and if with state elections it actually means competing every year, and every year becomes a sort of a, a typically a national issues election, then you, you're right. I mean, somehow the politicians have to play that game and not compromise good economic policy. Uh, I, I mean, I think. Personally, if they understand uh, what is at stake, it should be possible. But you know, there is no substitute to having an informed and aware electorate. 
I mean, the idea that the electorate doesn't understand that the electorate is easily fooled uh, by short-term goodies and we're still going to have some good results, that perhaps is not, uh, not credible. But that's the point that, you know, when, when, uh, when, when an electorate chooses, it should be as much as possible an informed choice. And that's the importance of public debate. That's the importance of bringing out what's really happening and keeping, keeping an eye on actual developments. And I just hope that we'll see a lot of that and more of that in future. Well, I, 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 share, the opti I share the hope, but not op the optimism. optimism. There's a very famous, I can't remember, one of the Europe's politicians used to say, um, uh, I think it was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, that we all know what to do, but none of us knows what, how to survive in the elections that follow. And, uh, and that's basically the problem. I, I can take, I think, three more questions. Anybody else? Uh, gentleman, right at the back there. Yes, please. And no, there, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, I'm, yeah, perfect. Hi, Sid Mehta here. Um, my question to uh, both of you, um, when you started out from college, the rupee was probably at seven rupees or something to the dollar, it's now about 70 something. Um, is there any awareness, or is there any thought that we actually need to go 10 times forward just to be standing still? And is there ever a thought that we really need to move forward rapidly as a country? Does that ever come into the thoughts of uh, bureaucrats, of leaders, uh, of other people in government? OK. Um, uh, yes, OK. Go ahead. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I, I will explain. OK. What, I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'm Ashok Advani from Business India. Uh, both of you have been saying things which, you know, very few people can disagree with what should be done, what's rational, what's sensible. But the reality is that if you take tax terrorism, it started under Chidambaram and Mukherjee. It's just been fine-tuned by the subsequent governments. Um, if you take this, what you mentioned, that the finance ministry has no role with the banking sector, the reality is that for the best part of the time that you and Manmohan Singh were in the finance ministry, the finance ministry interfered on everything. Why? The finance ministry had what? Its hand interfered on, on every issue. Had its hand on everything. Is that what yes. you said? On, on every financial issue in the banking sector. Yes. Okay. And I think this gentleman. Sorry. My name is Gopala Krishnan. I'm very <clears throat> interested to know why agriculture has never been discussed. Why is agriculture in such a bad shape and what would you have wanted to have done about it? Okay, the first question, I think, if I got it right, I, the numbers might be wrong, in which case I apologize, but essentially, over the course of your professional life, the rupee has depreciated tenfold against the dollar. And what on earth is the point of that? And why on earth was that necessary? And doesn't it indicate a complete failure of Indian policy that you can't actually have a stable currency? <laughs> I'm making it a bit more pointed, but I think that's the question. <laughs> no, I mean, look, um, what happens to the exchange rate in virtually any public discussion is always a sensitive issue. Now, if you're going to have a flexible exchange rate, then the market will determine where the exchange rate goes. I will only suggest that it is a huge mistake to think that having a strong exchange rate is going to give you a strong economy. What is true is that if you have a strong economy, it will lead to a stronger exchange rate. So um, a market determined strengthening of the exchange rate, which reflects the fact that you've generated huge productivity growth, your inflation rates are low, et cetera, et cetera, is a good thing. But if for whatever reason your productivity rates are not that high, your domestic inflation rates are high, it is not a good idea to keep the exchange, keep the rupee firm. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're weakening the economy. You know, remember, the, the Americans keep beating up the Chinese because they have an undervalued exchange rate. And the Chinese regard themselves as one of the most successful economies in the world, and you do too. So I think this whole thing, uh, need, we need to be very clear about it. Either you say 
I don't believe in having a flexible market determined exchange rate. Let's fix the exchange rate and then we can proudly say 20 years, for 20 years, that the rupee hasn't budged an inch, uh, but the economy has gone, gone downhill. I mean, that, that is what would happen. So that's, what was the next one? Uh, the next one is the tax terrorism was yeah. in fact the invention of yeah. your government and the yeah. successor is merely fine-tuning. And furthermore, there was a, an additional rider to uh, this, again, I'm putting it in the most invidious possible way, which is the finance ministry knew exactly what was going on in the banks, was largely cheering what was going on in the banks. It was what created the huge investment boom, including the financing of a lot of these PPP pro projects which are in your book. So actually, you're entirely responsible. <laughs> uh, no, no, look, uh, I think, uh, I didn't mean to suggest that some of these problems didn't exist earlier, but I'm, I'm taking a longer view. I mean, I'm of the view that if you really want well-functioning public sector banks, you should get the finance ministry out of it. And that has been true since 1991. Uh, for some reason, and this is across the board, no political party is willing to support it. In fact, Yashwan Sinha uh, in the BJP government of uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee had announced that we're going to reduce the government stake in uh, public sector banks to 33%. He made that statement in parliament but wasn't able to implement it because the party didn't support him. So this is not, I wasn't making a partisan point. I think this is a real problem uh, and how it's going to be handled, I can't judge, but uh, to my mind, continuing with this system is not going to give you a healthy uh, banking system. And by the way, since we have liberalized private sector banks, and since the share of credit that the private sector banks now hand out has increased significantly, either you will resort to continuous regulatory forbearance, which would be very bad, and continuous refinancing, I mean, uh, capitalization of public sector banks, or sooner or later, the share of public sector banks in total lending will shrink. It is shrinking already. So to my mind, uh, rather than see the sector privatize, we should have no hesitation in privatizing some of the individual public sector banks. Another, I mentioned it earlier, the pj &I committee system. It should be implemented. Whether there's political support for it or not, I don't know. But you know, in the debate, th these are the issues that should be raised. Why are we not doing it? Why do you think it's a bad idea? And I think we need more discussion of that. Your very last question to be answered before we close, and then your admirers will ask you to sign the book. Um, um, agriculture, which yeah. after all <clears throat> still supports almost half the, the livelihoods of almost half the people of India, and, and that's pretty good, an important issue, isn't it? You know, uh, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, issue, and uh, all I can say is that uh, when the reforms were introduced in 1991, uh, the decision to depreciate the currency, the decision to reduce protection to Indian industry, these were, in relative price terms, things that made agriculture much more profitable. Uh, they were never put forward, uh, and they couldn't be put forward as pro-agriculture measures, but they were actually pro-agriculture measures. So it's not that uh, the concern of agriculture was ignored. However, I think you're right in saying that we do need a very basic structural change in the environment, the economic environment in which agriculture now functions. Because we are able to produce the food grains we need. I mean, we have a huge stock of food grain, much above any normal level. So agriculture has to diversify out of food grains into all sorts of other crops, horticulture, etc. The usual instruments for price support, which are given for food grains, cannot be applied in horticulture, and therefore marketing reforms are critical. Now these, frankly, are in the realm of state governments. So this is an area where it is the state governments and the state governments alone that can take these steps. Now we've been recommending this, maybe the, the one thing the central government could do, and I certainly recommended it to the UPA, they didn't do it, 
the NDA isn't doing it either, the central government should repeal the Essential Commodities Act. I mean, it is an awful legislation which is designed only to harass traders. The notion that it helps to control prices is absurd. All that it does is it prevents any sensible private sector person from investing large amounts of money in setting up a logistics and storage system uh, for fear that somebody may impose a destocking limit and that would be the end of your economic rationality. Why it hasn't been done, I don't know. By the way, it's, I'm not the only one saying this. The current economic survey, the most recent economic survey, says exactly the same thing. So econo economists' voices across governments have been saying we should do this. And I think it's up to the larger sort of uh, political constituency to ask governments that, look, if all these fellows are saying it, why aren't you doing it? There's nothing else that you can say from a technical point of view. There is just one, I felt, there's a very last remark and then we'll close it. I, in the mid 60s, as of course you all know, Montek has mentioned another same, the, the, the famous Bell mission, there was a very significant food shortage issue in India. And when I, uh, and this became an obsession of the World Bank, which then got involved in funding the Green Revolution, which was one of the good things we did. Um, but I remember very well my very first, the very first request I got from the president of the World Bank in 1974, when I was given this job on India, uh, was to answer the following question. The president was Robert McNamara. How likely is it that as India's population grows, they, and on what assumptions that they will be able actually to grow enough food to feed themselves. And his concern was that there will be a famine. Um, and the population, I think, has tripled since then, something like that, mm -hmm. you can tell me. And nobody thinks about this. I think that's one of the most fascinating, un largely taken for granted and unmentioned achievements and it is an extraordinary one. And I can tell you that when I sat down, I knew nothing about it. Ridiculous to ask me the question. I got more intelligent people to work on it. But when I, start, when I started working on it, nobody thought it was a ridiculous question. Mm -hmm. So there is something rather big happened. Anyway, um, we're going to conclude the discussion. But before um, uh, uh, Panendo Chatterjee finishes, I just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed being here and how much I've enjoyed this discussion. And you've almost convinced me on most things. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.